DW Living Planet with Charlie Shield. Farmers in Holland grapple with the government's drastic nitrogen emissions cuts. Uh, there are a lot of people in Parliament who have no idea what they're talking about when they're talking about a farm. And it's all not true. The biggest dam removal project of all time to bring salmon back to their native habitat in Northern California. Where we're standing right here, in November of next year, the dam will be gone. And the new fruit putting down roots in an ever warmer Western Germany. There are many studies and prognoses that show quite clearly and convincingly that we are going to have a Mediterranean climate, at least in the western parts of Germany and in other regions as well, especially if we are continuing the way we live at the moment and the way we uh, produce greenhouse gases. That's all coming up on Living Planet. I'm Charlie Shields. The Netherlands may be one of Europe's smallest countries, but it's also one of its biggest food producers. It's the EU's top meat exporter and the world's fourth biggest exporter of milk, which requires a lot of cows and pigs and chickens. And partly because of this, for several decades now, Holland has had a nitrogen problem, a crisis. The country produces so much nitrogen that an excess of it in the air, the soil and water is causing large swaths of trees to die out across the country. The loss of unique ecosystems like heathlands and species to disappear, like flowering plants, birds, bees and butterflies. Successive government failures to get a handle on the problem mean that today drastic measures are being put in place to lower emissions mainly at the expense of farmers, many of whom are in debt and operate on very thin margins. In response, farmers have been raising a stink. Charis McGowan visited some in the north of the country. I don't know that Louise is 25. Charco is crouching down next to a calf, checking him over. The calf's mother is licking her newborn. The little one blinks as he glimpses daylight for the first time. For Charco, this is a fairly common scene. He has over 130 cows on his dairy farm. I don't know the name of every cow, but I know every cow by number. My favourite cow? Well, I have a few. Charco knows all of the cows, by number, if not by name. He says they all have different personalities. We approach one, Louise, number 25, who loves to be cuddled. He's the third generation to work on the farm. His grandfather started in the 1960s, a generation that lived through the hunger of the Second World War. Now my opa, he is actually now the oorlog. My grandpa began farming here after the war with the idea of never go hungry again as we really knew about hunger in the Netherlands then. The farm grew from a few dozen cows to the 130 that Charco now looks after, each providing 25 litres of milk per day. But Charco's farm is threatened by new nitrogen regulations recently introduced by the Dutch government in a bid to cut down on pollution and greenhouse gases. But for him, That would mean reducing his cattle from 130 to around 85 cows, which would lead to financial ruin. A farm is very capital intensive. If I build a barn, it will take 30, maybe 40 years to earn the investment back. And the rules change so quickly that if I build a stable now, in five or six years they might say I can no longer keep so many cattle and it will have to be demolished or renovated. In other words, I won't be able to earn back the stable. I have 140 cows now and if I have to go back to 80, 85 cows, I can no longer pay the bills. Ja, en daar kan ik de rekeningen niet van betalen. The nitrogen emission regulation has been celebrated by environmental activists, but farmers believe they are being used as scapegoats. 
Dr Katie Manning is a lecturer on climate change business and society at King's College London. She also works in the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, providing analysis on land use framework in the UK. She says dairy farms have been plagued by the issue of manure and slurry management for quite some time. And what happens essentially is that if you get excess slurry or excess manure runoff from farms, that enters the waterways and that ends up in a result of eutrophication. And what eutrophication does is essentially it's, it's an overload of nutrients in the system, which will lead to algae blooms and will often create what we call dead zones in, in waterways. So there's the devastating effects of excess nitrogen from slurry on the ground. And then we also have the air pollution issue. And what you get from that is nitrous oxide is one of the greenhouse gases. It's about 300 times more potent than carbon dioxide. It has a very long lifetime as well. It's about a 114-year lifetime before it begins to degrade. Um, and it's about 6% of current greenhouse gas emissions um, in the global inventory. So it is one of the major contributing factors um, to air quality and to climate change. Uh, so these kind of have much wider systemic impacts than perhaps some people would think. I think we often, nitrous oxide is like the forgotten greenhouse gas in many respects. Nitrogen pollution is a pressing issue that needs to be addressed, and farmers are caught in the crossroads of the discussion. The strict measures the Dutch government is taking has led to a backlash among the Dutch farmers, who created their own political party to rally for the rights of their industry, the Farmer Protest Party, which is called the BBB in the Netherlands. Eddie van Maren is the leader of the Groningen segment of the BBB. We speak to him on a dairy farm that belongs to his friend Omgo, not too far from Charco's land. Uh, there are a lot of people in Parliament who have no idea what they're talking about when they're talking about a farm. And there is being taught a lot of nonsense about farming. Uh, they are polluters, they abuse animals, uh, they dump manure. And it's all not true. Uh, it's, it's, it's far more complicated than this simple thing. Eddie takes me around three farms and he points out all the sustainable initiatives undertaken by farmers. Clean energy. And this is what you see a lot in uh, Dutch farms. There's solar panels, windmills and irrigation ditches made specifically to attract meadow birds and create hospitable atmospheres for local wildlife around grazing areas. But Eddie says that none of this is being taken into account by current regulations. Cows may be forced to remain in barns to produce less nitrogen emissions, which will mean worse conditions for the cows themselves and impact on the farm's role as a refuge for animals like meadow birds. So the, 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 the people who are doing the most for nature are being affected uh, the most by, by this policy. Actually, it's chasing the cows into the barn again. Back to Dr Katie Manning in London. From an expert perspective, she totally agrees with Eddie's points. Shrinking cattle farms is not necessarily the answer. European policy post-World War II was intensify. Feed, feed the country. That was, that was the policy for a very, very long time. And not only dairy, but also meat producers are being told, no, now we want to get rid of all of our, all of our red meat. You know, we, we, we have to destock. Everybody has to destock. And there are, there are serious kind of consequences to that because, of course, you have complex ecological dynamics. For example, in kind of grasslands of, of Europe, we have a, there's a very careful um, dynamic between the grazers and biodiversity in the grasses. So you can, you can overgraze, you can, de you know, increased stocking numbers can be a very detrimental thing to overgrazing. However, you can also undergraze. So if you undergraze, what happens is the um, you, you kind of get processes called things like interheft drift, where first of all, cattle will move across the landscape and they'll move into other parts of, of the landscape in a way that then makes it untenable for farmers to reclaim them. And it gets very difficult because they will essentially occupy available niches. Um, but you also get this, this lack of competition in grasses. So you'll get the highly competitive grasses will take over if they're undergrazed. And those grasses are less biodiverse. So on one hand, nitrogen emissions are hugely damaging for the environment and dairy farms are major polluters. But on the other hand, dairy farms also play an important role in maintaining local biodiversity, not to mention providing employment and ensuring food security. So 
it's a catch-22. What's the way forward? If anything, farmers are part of the solution. They are the managers of the environment, managers of the land. What we need to be doing is we need to be promoting an innovative farming industry that supports the farmers and supports food production whilst also supporting environmental sustainability. Because we can't just say, this is, this is what you can't do and we're not going to give you options for what you can do. It, it's, 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 it's not a just transition. Manning mentions technologies such as nitrogen trappers to slash emissions so actually finding new ways to harness pollutants that don't lead to the demise of the dairy industry. All of the farmers I spoke to were keen to improve sustainability, but were lacking tools to do so to meet regulations, which would mean culling cattle and investing in new technology. Additionally, farmers that don't meet the requirements are denied financial support from the EU, so credit lines have also dried up. The last farm I visit is in a small Dutch village called Batuswolde, in the northern province of Drenthe. The milk top is a business where locals can fill up their milk directly from a dispenser, in reusable glass bottles. There's no manned cash till. You write down exactly what you want and leave money in a coin box, or transfer it to the bank account. Behind the small shop is Marta Veinhaus' family farm. Marta is 19 years old and is studying dairy farming in Leerwarden. Yeah, I think you can say uh, the dairy farming is not a job, but it's a lifestyle. You live for your animals and you have to be here 24-7. The Veinhaus farm has around 70 cows, who are still milked manually every day. Despite the gruelling job, Marta wants to continue her family's business. She thinks that it's beautiful that her father and grandfather both worked here and she loves being around the cows. But she's frustrated with the government. When you have to achieve a goal, it takes some time. And when you finally have that goal, they say, you can't do it anymore, you have to to produce less. So you don't know anything about the future. Marta says this insecurity is particularly problematic for young farmers like herself. She doesn't know if she'll be able to continue her passion, her lifestyle and her profession as a dairy farmer because I don't know where this farm will be at 15 years. I'm Charis McGowan in Groningen, the Netherlands. Holland's nitrogen crisis is a complex, multifaceted issue, and we've only been able to touch on part of it in today's show. So if this story has piqued your interest and you'd like to know more about how it fits into the broader picture of food systems and the climate crisis... I really encourage you to read more, and I recommend checking out Monga Bay's recent three-part series on the topic on their website. Don't drink the milk. Weird name for a podcast, right? But it will all make sense, I promise. And no, it's not a podcast about milk. If you like historical intrigue, a bit of culture, and a sprinkling of controversy, this one's for you. The arguments of homeopathy are based on, like, sand, and the sand was pouring through my fingers. I'm Rachel Stewart, and for this new podcast from DW, I'm travelling around Europe, tracing the backstories of objects, ideas and movements that you know well. But maybe you never really stopped to think how these things got to you. Condoms are known as French letters in the 19th century. Syphilis is the French disease, but in France it's the Italian disease. Join us to follow the strange journeys of these everyday things and see how they change shape as they're exported through time and around the world, by force, by chance or by choice. The less appealing the passport seems, the more dodgy stuff is probably going on. And yes, we're picking the juiciest stories, ones with a little mystery or drama along the way. We've got a lot to explore. Colonialism. Migration. Alternative medicine. Digital revolutions. Actual revolutions. And even some edible or rather drinkable stuff too. Woo, tangy. No need to pack your bags. Just subscribe to Don't Drink the Milk wherever you listen to podcasts. We head to California now, where, for the past 59 years, the Yurok tribe has celebrated its salmon festival in Klamath, in the northwestern corner of the state. But this year, there was just one important thing missing from the festival. The salmon. This fish holds both a spiritual and existential meaning for the Yurok people and other Native American tribes in the region. But not that many salmon swim in the Klamath River anymore. 
a river that flows through California to Oregon. And the main reason for that is the dams, which were originally built to produce hydropower. Over the past 100 years, though, the dams have been throwing the ecosystem out of whack. But the good news is the salmon could be about to return as authorities undertake what they say is the biggest ever dam removal project of all time. Niels Dumps has this story, presented by Evelyn McClafferty. Lake Capco is quiet, apart from the whir of Francis Gill's air conditioner. His house sits by the water, but soon the lake will be gone. The mood of the community is pretty upset. Francis Gill's life on the lake in California is idyllic. There's a barbecue on the terrace, and just a few feet away, surrounded by shrubs, is a small jetty. Around 100 people live here. They all have boats, they water ski, for now anyway, because things are about to change. They expect the lakes to uh, to go down three to five feet per day. Basically, as if someone just pulled a stopper out of a giant bathtub. The lake will be drained starting January until only the Klamath River remains. The grief is about losing the lake because every one of us came up here because we wanted to live on a lake. While some mourn the loss of the lake, local Native American communities are rejoicing. They see the lake as a threat to their livelihoods. That's because it's actually a reservoir created by a dam. Dams heat up the water and block salmon returning from the Pacific to spawn. As a result, the salmon population has dropped dramatically. Our culture views the fish as kin. Luis Neuner is a member of the Karuk people. It's the second biggest tribe in California. He lives on the Klamath River. His biological father is German, and that's why he's trying to... To maintain and nurture my Bavarian roots. <laughs> Salmon is still very important for the Karu community. The closest supermarket to my home is two hours away, and there's not much else around. And he says... Salmon is like gold for us. If I can get my hands on a tin of salmon, I'm rich. Luis is 24. His community, as well as others, have been fighting against the dams for nearly all of that time. The tribes held dozens of protests in front of government buildings and energy company headquarters. According to some historians, the dams were also an attempt by white settlers to displace Native American communities which is another reason their removal is important, says Luis. If you look at the bigger picture, the removal of the dams could maybe revitalise tribal identity and sovereignty. The Iron Gate Dam is the largest of the four dams being demolished along the Klamath River. The water here reaches down around 50 feet. Where we're standing right here, November of next year, the dam will be gone. That's Ren Brunel a spokesperson for the Klamath River Renewal Corporation, which is coordinating the dam removals. While the reservoir levels, once we're really confident that the reservoirs are on the way down, they're not going to refill anymore, we will immediately start restoring the area with our, our contractor will, will resource environmental solutions, where they will be hand seeding. And by the pr- time the project's underway, they will have 17 billion seeds to work with. The project will cost 450 million US dollars, financed through taxes and by dam operator Pacificorp, which is part of billionaire Warren Buffett's business portfolio. The dams were only ever used for one thing. Power generation, they don't provide any agricultural uh, irrigation. These dams were not very effective at creating power anymore. They're just also just not up to, to modern standards. So it would have been a significant cost to bring them up to to modern standards. Water quality will improve significantly once the dams are dismantled, says Ren Brunel. But it could take years before salmon numbers recover. It's not just about the dams. Luis Neuner from the Karuk tribe again. The dams are just the beginning. Our culture has to heal. We will celebrate, but we've got a lot of work ahead of us.
One of the first things I saw when I arrived here in West Germany on the train as it snaked along the river years ago was the beautiful Ahr Valley. Lush, rolling hills with rows and rows of grapevines sloping down to the river. It's a traditional wine-growing region known for its crisp white wines. The people here, though, have had a really tough last few years, as they've been hit by both deadly floods and devastating drought, and they continue to grapple with unpredictable weather and rising temperatures, which makes it pretty difficult to grow grapes like they used to. That hasn't stopped one local man from trying to get another, different kind of fruit to put down roots, though. Kathleen Schuster has this story. It takes about five minutes to walk halfway up this terraced vineyard. Five minutes of very carefully maneuvering narrow stone steps covered in broken slate up a very steep slope. <laughs> A man named Oliver Heimerman is growing dozens of olive trees here in Germany's R Valley. He actually works in telecommunications, but he also imports fine olive oils. His culinary curiosity for olive oil grew over many a vacation in Tuscany, and now he has his eye on making olive oil right here in Germany. He shows off a young arbequina, a type of olive tree found in Spain, with slender silvery green leaves. The olive trees are something I'm working on with my brother-in-law. We had an idea, inspired by a glass or two, to try to grow olive trees, because it's actually getting warmer here. It's a good climate to test out our idea in. A good climate indeed. This autumn, it's been in the upper 20s, unheard of for October. His brother-in-law, who's a winemaker by the name of Peter Kriechel, used to use this steep slope for the grapes that make cool, crisp Riesling wine. Now, eight of its terraces are dotted with young olive trees. Many are barely a meter tall. They're imported from a nursery in Tuscany and paid for by sponsors from around Germany. The delicate trees lean on wooden stakes for support as they settle into this foreign northern European soil. A lot of people have weighed in, and as always, the opinions run the gamut. If you talk to biologists from around here, they'd like to use native plants to help with climate change. They tend to be critical and say this type of project won't work. But then there are others, like the biologist who works for my brother-in-law at the Kriechel Winery, who's helping us. He says it's working. You can see it. And they're not the only ones who think olive trees have a future in Germany. About 30 kilometers north of the Ahr Valley, the curator of the botanical gardens at the University of Bonn, a woman named Cornelia Lune, walks past a row of crops traditionally grown in warmer climates. She leads the way to the olive trees. These are our olive trees that were planted here about five to six years ago. Outdoors. A few of them stand in a row on a well-kempt lawn. They're thriving, despite experiencing frost this year, a no-no for olive trees. As you can see here, we had to cut some branches that were just frozen over winter. But you can also see a tree sprouts quite nicely. So Back in her office, she says olive trees don't need much when it comes to soil. Olive trees are not very demanding in terms of soil, and that's why they are grown in areas that can't be used for anything else, can't be used for, for agriculture, for growing crops. That's where olive trees grow, so they're perfect for the wine areas as well, because it's sunny, it's dry, and well-drained soil. And sunny and dry conditions are what the projections for future weather patterns are pointing to. There are many studies and prognoses that show quite clearly and convincingly that we are going to have a Mediterranean climate, at least in the western parts of Germany and in other regions as well. Um, in the foreseeable future, no one really knows whether it will be in 10 years or in 50 years, but we are going to have it, especially if we continuing the way we live at the moment and the way we uh, produce greenhouse gases. But a hotter, drier northern Europe would also mean an even hotter, even drier southern Europe, where the olive oil industry is already suffering from drought and deadly fungus. On the road to Oliver Heimerman's original testing spot, 
it's hard to miss how climate change has already shaped the area. For example, an old stone bridge with no water under it. The R River used to run under it, but now it runs around it. These images from Antweiler show the force with which the R River swept through the valley. Vehicles bobbing in the flood water. The consequences were devastating. In July 2021, extreme rain sent a surge of seven meters of water through the valley in a matter of hours. Many more still missing. Infrastructure has collapsed. The unprecedented flooding left 135 people dead and caused widespread destruction. There's no drinking water. Emergency service. Someone has put large white letters that spell Danke, thanks, along the Bear River Bank. It's for the people who've helped the valley recover. High above in the vineyards, though, the memory of the flood seems to fade away as row after row of lush green grapevines come into view. People are busy harvesting. And there's only so much room for tractors and cars on these paths. The R is known for its red wines, Flu und Spätburgunder, and like Germany's other wine regions, crisp white wines like Riesling and Weißburgunder. But Heimermann says the conditions are changing so rapidly here that the winemakers have started experimenting with Chirac and Cabernet, too. We can see this change with the grapevines, like types of Frühburgunder, for example, which are, I'd say, being harvested earlier now. They're also being grown in Sweden. In Sweden? Yeah. <laughs> Growing olive trees is a different business entirely, though. It takes at least seven years until a tree can produce olives for olive oil. And then you need about 10 kilos of olives to make just one liter of olive oil. There are about 50 trees up here at the original, more hands-off testing spot. Most of them are young, but the ones that are about 10 years old have plump green olives that look good enough to eat. Big mistake. Very bitter. <laughs> That's why olives need to be marinated first. In, in Spanien werden sie so October. Heimerman says they won't harvest these olives till November, and when all is said and done, they'll only need about an hour to pick the branches clean. He knows the olive groves he dreams of will take years, if not decades, to flourish and produce olive oil. That is, if all goes well. He seems really optimistic, though. Yes, I definitely am. Everyone needs a crazy idea. And as you can see, this one is bearing fruit, which is why we're optimistic that olives will be cultivated here. Yeah. Kathleen Schuster, DW, the R Valley. That report from the R Valley in Germany brings us to the end of this week's Living Planet. As always, thank you so much for listening. If you like the show and you've got a moment, leave us a rating and a review in Apple Podcasts or Spotify or whichever app you use to listen to podcasts. You can also always get in touch with us by emailing livingplanet at dw.com. My name is Charlie Shield. We'll be back next week with more environment stories from around the world.